We're glad to be sharing the ministry of Redemption Church with you. Now join us as we receive the Word of God. Welcome to Redemption Church. My name is Marshall Blessing. I'm the care pastor here. I'm glad to see you all in the house of God today. It is a good day. Now, I've heard all my life this saying. You've probably heard it too. Jump in if you know the words. A quitter never wins, and a winner never quits. Period. That's right. There are times in our life when we need to persevere, when we need to push on and keep going. In general, don't be a quitter is a good lesson. It's a good lesson for us. It's a good lesson for children because usually it's easier to quit than to persevere and see things through. But there are times in our life when we need to quit. There are times in children's life when we wish they would quit. (laughs) Now, I don't know this from personal experience with my son, but I've seen other parents and heard them say things like, quit hitting your brother, quit quit drawing on the walls. Would you quit spitting? Quit licking the car seat. Quit running with those scissors. If you're doing something that could harm yourself or others, it's good to quit. Amen? Amen? If we're doing things that negatively impact our lives, then we need to quit. If at some point during this series you realize that you're doing something that's hurting you or holding you back, our hope is that you will resolve to quit. In that sense, it's okay to be a quitter. It's good to say, I quit. Last week, Pastor Chris told us about things we could be doing that could be sabotaging our life. And when we do those things, we are actually hating our life. He told us that we need to quit hating our life. If you missed it, or if you would just like to review, it's posted on our website. I encourage you to check it out. Share it with somebody. For those of you who were here, how many of you took his advice to heart? Let's see, show of hands. How many of you have quit hating your life? Don't be shy. How many of you would say you love your life? A couple. That's good. Those of you who raised your hands will want to pay close attention today. Today, I want to tell you to quit loving your life. (laughs) Wait a second, what? Is that a typo? No. I realized last week we told you to quit hating your life. (laughs) Quit loving your life. I realize that sounds harsh, especially coming from the care pastor. But that's what the book says. Let's take a look. John chapter 12, verse 25. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world We'll keep it for eternal life. These are the words of Jesus. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Anyone who hates their life will keep it. Jesus says, quit loving your life. Now, this teaching doesn't sound out of character coming from a Messiah who tells us things like, The first will be last, and the last will be first. Love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. And pick up your cross and follow him. But it still sounds a little jarring. It sounds a little bit shocking. Well, not for me. It sounds like an easy setup for a sermon. Quit loving your life. It's not that good. 
get over it. In this world, you'll have problems. Quit loving your life. If you got questions, catch me on my way to the car. I'm just kidding. It sounds like Jesus is telling us to hate our life. If we take this verse literally, it almost doesn't make sense. If you love your life, you will lose it. But if you hate your life, it will last forever. What? So, clearly, there must be something else going on here. And we need to make sure we understand what Jesus is really telling us. All right? There is one other verse where Jesus tells us to hate our life. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Well... There you go. I guess it's good that we didn't preach on this scripture on Mother's Day. But this is a good one to keep in mind because Father's Day is coming up. No, I don't believe that Jesus actually wants us to hate our family. He wouldn't command us to hate our mother and father because that would violate one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother. And we all know that Jesus did not sin. And he is the fulfillment of the commandments. Jesus doesn't want us to hate anyone. All right. So instead, Jesus is telling us we cannot love our parents or our siblings or our spouses or our children more than we love God. All right. Matthew's gospel puts it in slightly different terms. Matthew 10, verse 37. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I love my parents, but I love Jesus more. I love my wife, but I love Jesus more. More. God blessed me with a wonderful son, and I love him. But I have to remember how good God is, how much he loves me. I have to remember to love God more because the more I love God and the closer I follow Jesus, the better I'll be able to love my son and my wife and my parents. Amen. If I love God more than them, I will be able to love them more than I would otherwise. And so, as my son grows up, I hope he loves Jessica and I. But I pray that he loves Jesus more. In the same way, Jesus isn't telling us to hate our own lives. I don't want anyone to leave here today thinking they should constantly be in a bad mood or they should focus on the bad things that happen to them so that they can, I've got to hate my life. Oh, my life is terrible. Mm. Oh, I stubbed my toe. Yeah, that's right. I hate my life. Oh, the microphone's messing up. I hate my life. No, I don't want you to think that. Or worse, I don't want anyone to leave here today thinking that they need to do bad things to make their life terrible so they will hate it. Jesus does not want you to hate your life. But we need to quit loving our life more than we love Jesus. Now, while we're making sure we understand what Jesus is talking about, it's important that we define what he means by life. Our first scripture, the first scripture we read today, comes from John's gospel, John 12, 25. But then, a few chapters later, in John 14, Jesus says, he is life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says he is life. But 
Jesus isn't telling us to hate him. Here, Jesus is talking about our old life, our earthly life, our physical life. Ultimately, God is the source of our life. We're alive because of him. But once we're born, until we learn the truth about God, we can come to believe that what we can see and hear and touch and feel is all that there is to life. Some people never get past that point. This is the old life. This is our physical life. But Jesus offers us a new life in him. Jesus tells us we must be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. We must be born into a new life. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. John puts it this way in 1 John chapter 5, starting at verse 11. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. When we come to believe in Jesus Christ as our savior, we can enter into this new life. And by loving and following him, we live this new life. So we can't love this new life of faith in Jesus more than we love Jesus because he is the life. But meanwhile, we are still alive here on earth. We can be living a new life as part of God's kingdom, but we are still living our earthly physical life. We still eat. We still sleep. We still experience this world with its temptations and its pleasures. We still live our day-to-day -day life. But we can't let the things of this world come before God. We can't let our earthly physical life take priority over God because in doing so, we are loving our old life more than we love him. We can take a look at this life we're living and come to love it. There's an epidemic today of people loving their life. Just look at social media. I want to tell you how big a problem that is. But first, I want to take a selfie. All right. Great. If you love your earthly life, you will lose it. But if you love Jesus more than your old physical life, if you love Jesus as your life, you will live a new life that will last to eternity. Does that make sense? It's important that we understand Jesus' teachings. If you have any questions about it, don't hesitate to ask. You can ask us in person or use our anonymous text line. 214-856-0550. We'd love to talk to you about that. We love talking about scripture. We want to make sure that you understand what Jesus is saying. This scripture can be confusing. So if you got questions, bring them to us. Again, I don't want anyone to go home thinking that Jesus wants them to hate their life. Our lives, the fact that we are alive, is a gift from God. God loves us, and he wants us to be happy. I believe the things that Chris preached about last week are correct. We shouldn't hate our life. Just don't let the things of this world, the things of this life, come before God. We should appreciate the gift of life that God has given us. Don't hate your life. At the same time, don't get too attached. This world is temporary. God is permanent. Now, 
Some of you may have heard the title of this message, I quit loving my life, and thought to yourself, that's easy, I'm there. Maybe you don't feel like you have a great life. Maybe you're not enjoying life right now. Maybe you feel more challenged by last week's instruction to quit hating your life. I hope that changes. But listen up. You still need to pay attention today. Because even if you don't feel like you have a great life, even if you're not living your best life now, we can still be loving our lives in subtle ways. Loving your life doesn't mean that you wake up every morning with a big smile on your face and you jump out of bed and say, I love my life. We love our life when we define our life by the things of this world. You may not think you have a great life, but how are you making that determination? What are you measuring that by? We're loving our life when we define our life by the things of this world. Jesus warns against this in Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? What is your life based around? Our lives should be more than food or clothes or a house or a job. But we can tend to base our life on material things because that's what's in our face 24-7. That's what we can see. When we value our life and define our life based on the things of this world, we are loving the life that this world offers. A man came to Jesus who had every reason to love his life. He's mentioned in three of the Gospels, and he is known as the rich young ruler. Now, let's get this straight. He was rich, he was young, and he was powerful. If he was alive today, he'd be the bachelor. All right? Does that sound like a life that would be easy to love? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, he came to Jesus asking how he could inherit eternal life. And Jesus talks to him. And they establish that he has been obeying the commandments. Then this happens. Mark chapter 10, verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now Jesus is speaking in love, and he invites the man to follow him, and he tells him what he needs to do. But what happens? Verse 22, at this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. He goes away sad. He was known as the rich young ruler. That's how people knew him. Maybe that's how he thought of himself. But Jesus says, your identity shouldn't be based on your riches. Your identity should be based on me. He had every reason to be happy, but he goes away sad because his life is defined by his wealth and he can't let go of that. He came seeking something eternal, but he can't let go of something temporary. You may not be rich, you may not be young, you may not be a ruler, you may not feel like you have an especially great life, 
But if there is anything in your life that you're not willing to let go of for Jesus, then you love that part of your life in this world more than you love him. It could be anything. It could be a car. It could be a job. It could be a substance that you've come to depend on. You may not feel like you have a great life, but there's that one thing you do for escape that, man, that really gets you through. It could be your morning cup of Starbucks. If there is anything that you are not willing to let go of for him, then you love that part of your life more than you love Jesus. You're, you've got to realize you're holding on to things that are perishing and they're holding you back from the one thing that is eternal. Even if you devote yourself to these things, they ultimately won't bring you joy or peace or hope. They're all going to pass away. Don't let these things define who you are. You are a child of God. You are loved. Jesus died for you. Amen. You are so much more than these things. Again, they could be anything. They're not just material things. It could be a relationship that's holding you back. You're chasing after somebody, and that's distracting you from where you need to be with God. Maybe you love somebody and they don't love you and you can't think of anything but that. Maybe you're in a relationship and that other person, you know, doesn't think much of religion or church and so your faith life has been kind of dwindling in order to devote more time to them. Or maybe you're in a, you're in a relationship that's ended and you can't get past that. Whatever it is, are you willing to let it go for him? It could be a grudge that you aren't willing to let go. Somebody did something to you, and you're never going to forget it. You know, you don't mistreat that person, but it's always in there. It's always in there. You remember they did that thing. Are you willing to lay it down? For him, it could be your pride. Are you willing to set aside the way you see yourself? We spend a lot of time defining our identity. People spend a lot of time and money and effort to be a certain person to look a certain way, to have the right things, to, to portray their life in a certain way. Are you willing to let go of the identity that you've established for yourself in order to receive the identity that he has for you? Whatever you've got down here, it may be riches, it may be a title. It may be a million followers on social media. Or it may be that one thing in an otherwise not so great life that helps pull you through. Whatever it is, if it's not Jesus, then it's going to pass away. Whatever you've got down here, if it's not Jesus, it's perishing. Are you willing to let it go for him? Now, I'm not saying you have to sell all that you have and give to the poor and take a vow of poverty. I just want you to check yourself. What do you base your life on? Is there anything that you wouldn't be willing to let go. 
God knows your heart. Be honest with yourself. And if there is something that is holding you back from growing in your faith life, let it go. That's what repentance is. We turn away from the things that are leading us away from God. We turn back to him. Which one do you love more? God loves you more than you will ever know. And he will love you forever. That thing might be fun for a season. But it's going to end. Do you love God more? Are you willing to turn away from whatever it is? In a way, that's what baptism is. We lay down our old life symbolically in the waters of baptism to be buried with Jesus so that we can rise again to a new life in him. Do you love your life? Are you willing to lay it down for his? In the same way, that's what worship is. We're letting go of ourselves to focus on expressing our love for God. It might look weird to put my hands up or to kneel or whatever, but it's not about me. I love God, and this is how I feel led to express that love. I surrender all that I am to him. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. That's how we worship him when we gather here. But we also worship him through the way we live our lives. We worship Jesus through the way we live our lives for others. If we love our own life, we'll tend to put ourselves ahead of others. If we love our own life, we will tend to put ourselves ahead of other people. If we love Jesus, we will put others ahead of ourselves. Jesus repeatedly taught that we show love to him by showing love to others. Love your neighbor as yourself. Whatever you do for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you do for me. We serve those whom we love. If we love our own life, we will serve ourselves. But if we love God, we will recognize his love for other people. Everyone is made in God's image. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We will recognize his love for others and we will love and serve them as a way to love and serve God. Jesus is our example of who we should be. If we love Jesus more than our own life and our own self-interest, then we should seek to be like him. In Mark 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Philippians chapter 2 instructs us on how we should imitate Christ's humility. It includes this passage in verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. This is good instruction. And we can see it lived out in the Bible. If you want to see a good example of someone who quits loving their life and begins loving others, look to Zacchaeus. 
You all know Zacchaeus. Maybe you remember him from Sunday school. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector who had gotten rich off cheating people. He loved his life. But then he meets Jesus. Jesus shows Zacchaeus compassion and love. His life as a crooked tax collector had been good. Luke 19 and 8. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Zacchaeus is willing to give up this life that he had established. And in doing so, he wanted to repay those whom he had cheated beyond what he had taken. He wanted to show them love as Jesus had shown him love. In truth, a life of following and serving Jesus goes beyond loving others as we love ourselves. The night before he was crucified, Jesus gave some important last-minute instructions to his disciples. In John chapter 15, verse 12, he tells them, My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. This is huge. This is revolutionary. For hundreds of years, the Jewish people had been trying to obey the commands of God. And for hundreds of years, they had remained the same. And now, in a garden at night, Jesus just throws out a new one. Love each other as I have loved you. What does that mean? Well, Jesus continues in verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down his life for his friends. He commands us to love as he loves. We need to quit loving our life and start living his life. If we love our life, we will love, we will live our life. Let me say that again. If we love our life, we will live our life. But if we love Jesus and our life is found in him, we will live like him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6 puts it this way. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Now this is no small thing. Jesus laid down his life for others, for us. We will never get there if we love our life. You may have been going to church a long time. You may have read the Bible cover to cover multiple times. But still, it's hard. It's hard not to love your life and want to preserve it. It's hard to live as Jesus did. In fact, one of his disciples unfortunately discovered that he loved his own life more than Jesus. He had been with Jesus throughout his ministry. He had walked with Jesus. He had talked with Jesus. But then, when Jesus is captured, we find out who this disciple really loves. Do you know who I'm talking about? 
I'm talking about Simon Peter. You might have been thinking about Judas. Maybe he did too. But let's look at Peter. Peter had announced that Jesus was the son of the living God. Peter had said, no, Jesus, I will die before I let them take you. But then, when Jesus is on trial for his life, Peter denies him. Aren't you one of his followers? Haven't I seen you with him? Surely you are one of them. No, no, no. I swear I don't even know him. Peter was scared. They might kill him too. Peter loved his life. And the proof is that later Peter has gone back to the life that he had before he met Jesus. When we see him again, he's fishing. And Jesus calls to him from the beach. We fall short at times. We make mistakes. And we cling to our lives rather than to Jesus. But he's willing to forgive us when we turn back to him. Jesus talks to Peter on that beach. And Jesus asks him, Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your life? He asks him three times, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my lambs. Do what I would do. Live my life. Do you love Jesus? I hope you do. Do you love his life more than your own? Again, it's not easy to live as he lived and to be willing to lay down your life for others. But that's what we're called to do. And I'm not preaching this message to you today as somebody who's got it nailed down. I've got this figured out, and I'm walking the walk. I live just like Jesus did. I'm still working on it. I'm still a long way off. But that's what we're called to do. It doesn't mean you necessarily have to die for someone else. We can lay down our life in small ways every day as we put others ahead of ourselves. If you love Jesus and he is the life in you, then you will truly love your life. At the end of service every week, we open these altars and we invite everyone to come forward and talk to God. Right now, you have an opportunity to love God, to put your life aside and reach out to him. These altars are open. I invite you to come talk to him today. You can stay where you're at, stay in your life, or you can take a step out and reach out to him. Maybe there's something in your life that's holding you back. Maybe there's something that you're really reluctant to let go of. Come and talk to him about it today. Reach out to him. He loves you. These altars are open. I invite you to come. If you would like special prayer, stand within two feet of the steps and part of the pastoral staff. Thank you for joining us. For more information about redemption, look us up online at redemption-church.com and be sure to connect with us on Facebook and Twitter.